the Apostles and chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles and chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, and we'll read here from verse 1, please. Now Peter and John <clears throat> went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they led daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran to gather unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. And just one verse in chapter 4, verse 22. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Amen. And we know the Lord will bless to us the reading of his precious word. Just in the, the time that's remaining tonight... I want to speak on this passage of scripture and the title of my little message tonight is Only a Look. Only a Look. Someone used to say, you know, they can look daggers at you. Or they can give you a dirty look or a bad look. This look is a look of amazement. And you know, friends, when we uh, go through this story tonight and just see uh, what the Lord did in relation to to this man. This man, 40 years a cripple. It's a long time, over 40 years. Uh, he wasn't able to walk from birth from his mother's womb. So you can imagine uh, the sort of condition that this man was in. And uh, here in this particular passage, it's the, it's the infant days of the early church. The days of Pentecost hadn't that, maybe two or three days had passed. And Peter and John here are making the way, their way to the temple. And this is the first miracle that the apostles performed. And this is very important. This is the first miracle that the apostles performed that's recorded for us in the word of God after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And uh, from studying the scriptures, I believe that it wasn't so much in the upper room but it was in Solomon's porch where they were gathered and assembling that the Holy Spirit was poured out for the, there were multitudes who heard them and seen the tongues as a fire upon the disciples and heard them speaking in other languages and it was a public witness of the incoming of the Holy Spirit on the fulfillment of Christ's words. And so it was a very public outpouring. And Peter and John are going back and that gate beautiful is in close proximity with uh, Solomon's portico, if you're familiar with the second period temple, Herod's temple. And so <clears throat> Peter and John, they're making their way uh, to the place of prayer. 
And we read here just for a little bit of background in verse 1 of chapter 3. It said, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. The ninth hour. The ninth hour of the day would have been 3 p.m. in the afternoon. The Jewish clock works a little different to our Western clock. The Jewish day starts at 6 a.m. in the morning, and the third hour of the day is 9 o'clock a.m. The sixth hour of the day is 12 o'clock noon. The third hour of the day is 3 p.m. And the twelfth hour of the day is 6 p.m. And then in the evening time, the Jews look upon the clock as to talk about the first watch of the night. The first watch of the night is from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. is the first watch, three hours, they work in quarters. The second watch of the night is from 9 p.m. to 12 midnight. The third watch of the night is from 12 midnight to 3 p.m. in the morning. 3 a.m. in the morning. And then the fourth watch in the night, you read that in the scriptures, when Jesus walked on the water, the fourth watch of the night, that was sometime between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. So that gives you a wee sort of a picture about the Jewish clock and how they worked. And even today in Israel, if you were to go in Israel, Shabbat starts at 6 p.m. on a Friday evening is the start of their Sabbath and concludes at 6 p.m. on Saturday evening. And uh, that's the Jewish Sabbath. That they still work to that. So the third hour uh, of the day, when these men were making their, or the ninth hour, when these men were making their way to the temple, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon for the Jews met for prayer three times a day and they based that on Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Nine o'clock in the morning was when they went to the temple to pray. They prayed at 12 noon and they also prayed at 3 p.m. in the afternoon which was the time of the evening oblation or the evening sacrifice and that's the time when the Lord uh, was on the cross and he, he he gave up the ghost and the veil of the temple was rent in coincidence with uh, the Passover lamb being sacrificed in the evening hour. And then they had to get him into the tomb before six o'clock, before the weekly Sabbath began. So that sort of gives you a little picture of uh, the Jewish clock. So Peter and John, they're on their way to the temple. And you know, it's not wonderful that They want to go to the place of prayer. Uh, I love the Acts of the Apostles. It's the history book of the early church when it was just ignited by the Holy Spirit and uh, it gives you such great insight into what God was doing and how he had poured out his spirit and blessed and baptized these 120 disciples and they were full of the Holy Ghost and full of power and full of faith. And the Lord Jesus was starting to build his church. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And here's Peter and John. They're going up to uh, the house of God to pray. And here's this lame man sitting at this beautiful gate. This, this beautiful gate is known as the, the Eastern Gate. The Eastern Gate. And uh, that's where this man was. He was placed beside that. But I want you to notice about this man. There was a lameness from his mother's womb. This man was, was in an awful condition. Over 40 years he couldn't walk. We would, whenever I was a young boy, they used to talk about a cripple. You don't so much hear that. Maybe not politically correct today, but a cripple. No power in his legs, couldn't walk, and uh, depending upon others. And there was a lameness from his mother's womb. And you know, friends, in our unsaved days, there's a lameness in our soul. We have no strength to save ourselves. There's nothing we can do uh, to merit 
uh, God's goodness to us, we're lame and we're helpless and we're hopeless. Is not what the Word of God teaches. Those that are without Christ, they're without God, without hope in this world. There's a lameness. And this man was lame. That's his condition. Uh, but bless God that <clears throat> he had a couple of friends, or perhaps it was family that brought him every day and carried him and left him in verse 2 uh, outside the, the beautiful gate. So at least he had someone who had an interest. And many the time I think about that, you know, I was brought to a gospel meeting. Somebody had an interest. A Christian had an interest in me and brought me to a meeting such as this whereby I heard words, you know, that I needed to be saved. Would it be good if we can bring people to hear God's word? And so this this dear man, he's, he's in an awful condition. I pictured it a wee bit like sort of the homeless in society today. They're, they're, he was sitting there, he was crippled. He's, I don't know whether his legs are in open view or not, but he's well known, well recognized. He has tremendous need. There's no uh, DHSS and there's, there's no social security. There's no signing on. There's no give me my rights type of thing. He's totally depending on the generosity of others. Particularly, particularly the generosity of God's people. It's God's people that are going to the temple. And God's people have been responsible for blessing multitudes. Multitudes. Even go back into the history of England. Cadbury's chocolate. Lime trees. The Quakers. There's the social help that they give as Christians in building houses and meeting poverty, poverty and educating children. Abolishing slavery. The Christians have been the means of blessing multitudes. Sometimes we get bad press. We're a good group. We're the Lord's children. And even the little woman's mate didn't go unnoticed by the Lord. And so this man sitting in this place outside God's house and he's trusting God's people to give him a little to meet his needs. He needs food. He, he needs help. To meet his day-to-day -day needs. And a bit like the homeless today, as I say, they need, they need help. He's no mobility. He's no food. He's no future hope. No prospects. A few friends. Here he is, a beggar, asking for money and help. And he's outside this beautiful gate. This eastern gate. And if you were, excuse me, were there today, you'd see the steps up into the Temple Mount, which sat up so high on the Mount of Jerusalem. Up on that corner where the Eastern Gate is, is what's called Solomon's Portico, where there's all these arches, open arches, and a roof on it. And underneath that, this is where all the, the people assembled. And you're going in through this Eastern Gate. And uh, those gates were vast. They were uh, 31 feet by 62 feet so 31 feet high 62 feet wide mass they were made of Corinthian copper and in the distance it looked like gold golden gates you've heard the, the golden gates the eastern golden gates where the Lord Jesus is going to come through uh, when he comes back to Jerusalem when his feet hit the Mount of Olives and uh, the mountains split and the Lord will walk in through those eastern gates, the Messiah, whom they're praying for, waiting for, longing for. He's coming. And so this is where this man is sitting. And, you know, many a time I wondered, I wondered, did Jesus pass him on his earthly journeys? 
wonder did he see this crippled man sitting outside this beautiful gate and passed him by and you know he was healing so many but yet he didn't heal all and there's a lot we could say about that tonight but I don't want to focus on that but here's the amazing thing the Lord Jesus had a purpose he knew there was a day coming when he would be healed and that's the lovely thing about leaving it with the Lord for he knows what he's doing so there's a lameness from his mother's womb he's lame he's sitting outside this beautiful gate but it doesn't matter where we're placed while they're a beautiful gate or in the temple it didn't meet his physical needs as regards walking he had a need that beautiful things can't meet he needed a divine touch so there he is sitting you can imagine he's begging he's asking and so Peter and John, they're walking into the temple and they see this man, at verse 3, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asks an alms. An alms means, uh, give me something. He's, he's looking for, for finance, but give anything for the poor. You see them, the rattle, the tenor, anything for the poor. A little crumb. And so here he's asking Peter and John, anything for the poor. And Peter stops immediately in his tracks. And uh, we see here a lameness and a look. A look that changed his life forever. This man, another ordinary average day for him. He's sitting him down in the place where he had sat for years. He's over 40 years of age. How many years he had sat in this one spot, we don't know. But it certainly was years. And Peter and John see him and Peter says to him, Peter, he fastened his eyes upon him. That means he looked intently into his eyes. He looked intently into his face. He looked upon this man. He, he fixed his gaze upon him, Peter and John. And he looked intently on him. And Peter said to this man, he says, look on us here we see the boldness of Peter and John's faith now, do we have the power that Peter had today can we see these sorts of miracles today we could if it's the will of God but remember this is the early infant church and the Lord is manifesting and authenticating his word by the power and demonstration of the miracles that are being performed to authenticate the truth of the ministry that the Lord Jesus has truly risen from the dead. And these men are preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and signs and wonders are following the preaching of their message that the Lord Jesus is Messiah indeed. He's Yeshua whom they have crucified on the cross and God is accompanying and authenticating their ministry and message through signs following the preaching of the word. And so this man, immediately his, he looks on Peter and John and he's expecting to receive some money. Sadly today in our society, there are many who are involved in ministry and they're only in it for money. And that's a tragedy. And many today are living of the goodness of God's people and many and they're fleecing them for money. A true minister of the gospel will never appeal or ask for money to line his pocket. He, his desire is to bring people to Christ and God will supply every need. But this man, his condition is he's expecting for that's what he's asked for. He's, he's looking for a little help. Peter and John, their boldness, their faith. And you know, we see a wonderful truth here. No, we can't bring healing to people's legs like that today if God doesn't permit. 
but we can still share the same message. We can still proclaim the same Savior with the same power to save. And so Peter and John, they had tremendous boldness. Uh, did, did the Lord Jesus not promise these young disciples that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you? And Peter and John here, they're going to exercise this faith now. They've, remember, they've been walking with the Lord Jesus for three years. They had seen the wonderful miracles that he had performed. And now they're going to put this into action themselves. They're going to claim the promises of God. They're going to claim the promises of the Lord Jesus. They're, they're going to seek to fulfill God's word in their day and generation. So that's the faith that they had. And uh, Peter says, look on us. You know, we could go into the Old Testament here immediately in Numbers 21 and 9. Uh, when Moses had to put the brazen serpent up on the cross, do you remember when the children of Israel were rebelling against the Lord and he sent these fiery serpents amongst them and they bit them and the poison of the asps were killing them. And uh, Moses cried out unto God and Moses was told to place a serpent up on a pole like a cross and he placed it up high and he said, whoever gets bit, he said, Look to the pole, look to the cross, look and live. Just a look, a look of faith, a look of faith. And Peter and John is saying, look on us. And uh, this whole chapter, this whole passage of scripture doesn't finish away till the end of chapter four. Read it yourself when you go home to get the whole story. This is just the beginning. And uh, as Moses, John says, and as the Lord Jesus said in John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up. And here's Peter saying, look on us. Look and live. Look and be healed. Look, look and be saved. Not that there was any power within them, for there wasn't. But Peter and John, when they seen this man, here we see the, uh, the, the apostles' compassion for the needy and for the lost. The apostles' compassion. Peter and John said, look on us. This here is a look of love. They couldn't pass him by. There was a, a stirring in their heart when they seen this man's need and you know, you, you and I are like that. When we see people as Christians who, who are in need, doesn't it touch your heart? Doesn't it, doesn't it stir something deep within the emotions when you see the needs of others? Uh, I, I came, as I said, to the ladies' meeting, and not because I wanted to be with all the ladies, but I wanted to see the witness and the ministry of the gospel bus that I'd seen uh, Matt Ricky years ago. And, you know, we've seen some, some images and photographs of tremendous need. And you know, my heart was stirred. And one of the images was of a homeless man in a sleeping bag, sleeping outside the, church, the, the front of a, church's, a church doorway. And there he, that was his bed for the night. And the church was locked. And he's lying outside. And you know, Peter and John were stirred. This, this look, that when they seen this man, they had this look of love, they had the look of compassion, uh, and, and they wanted to do something for him. And they did what they could do. So they're looking. And they know that the Lord Jesus is able, and th there's a look of faith here. And that's what the Lord Jesus is looking for in our hearts, faith. For without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to the Lord must believe that he is, and he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How do we look at people today? How do we see them? You know, for many of us, and I can be guilty of this myself, we see people as trees walking. Remember the Lord Jesus said that. He said to the man, what do, you, what do you see? 
He says, I see people as trees walking. He didn't have clear vision. And the Lord touched his eyes again. What do you see now? Oh, he says, I see clearly. We need to see people as God sees them. Lost. Without God, without Christ, without hope. We need to see them as he sees them. We need to love them as he loves them and have compassion. We need that vision. But here also was this glorious divine opportunity to share the Lord Jesus. Peter and John stopped, fastened their eyes upon this man, said, Looking on, Look on us, we have something to impart. We have something to share with you. Now we can't, unless God does something mighty, lift people from wheelchairs today and give them their eyes back. Miracles like that today are very rare, but they still do occur. But they're rare. And he's able to do it if he wants. He's the same God. But we're able to bring them the same message. We can't guarantee them healing of their body, but we can guarantee, according to the word of God, salvation for their souls. That's the difference. And we can bring God's word. Here was a divine opportunity, and Peter was taking it, and the Lord will give us divine opportunities if we take them to share Jesus. So there was that look, that look of love. This lame man, he was expecting money. And as we see now, he got mobility. A lift. There was a lameness. And a look. And now there's a lift. Oh, hallelujah. There's life for a look. At the crucified one, there's life at this moment for thee. And Peter says, look on us. A lift that no one could deny. And uh, Peter said, silver and gold have I none. Boys, that's a message you need to be preached in America. It's not silver and gold have I none now. It's jets and, oh, don't start. Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That was a mighty declaration. A mighty declaration that day. This is the same Jesus of Nazareth. Just a few weeks prior, had been crucified outside the city walls as an imposter, as a false messiah. Crucified by the Romans, by the Gentiles, by the Jewish Sanhedrin and by the Jewish people as a false messiah, as a blasphemer. This is a mighty statement. This is none other than the one you crucified, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is what they're saying. They're making their public declaration clear. But all these masses of multitudes that are coming into the temple to worship God, they've now repaired the curtain that was rent in two and they've got it stitched and stitched together somehow to say no the way of God you can't get in now they've cobbled some old story together and these men are saying life is in the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth friends neither is there salvation in any other for there's none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved only him and so here Peter's declaring, silver and gold have I none, no money. That's what they didn't have. They didn't have the financial resources. And then the amazing thing is, sure, money and gold's no good to you if you have no health. Isn't that right? The old saying is, it's true that health is your wealth. And that's true. And the older we get, the more we realize how precious it is. But Peter says, silver and gold have I none. That's, that's what Peter and John didn't have, but this is what they did have. <laughs> they had the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. 
the same Holy Spirit that lives and abides in you as a child of God is the same Holy Spirit that was indwelling Peter and John in this blessed day. Same Holy Spirit. Same person of the blessed Trinity. Indwelling Peter and John indwells us as God's children. And uh, here's what he says. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So he had the words spoken. There's the faith. Imagine me making that declaration tonight from the pulpit on the crippled man here. You'd be queer and bold, wouldn't you? And then, after he makes the declaration, that's whenever he stretches out his right hand, verse 7, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. What a wonderful truth. Here, here's the, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. We see here faith and boldness, a loving heart, faith in the name of Jesus. And Peter takes this man by the right hand of faith. Peter has stretched out his hand. He has spoken. He has decreed. He has declared that the Lord Jesus is able to raise you up. That's, in a sense, the message of the gospel. The Lord Jesus has promised to heal the broken and hearted, to heal the sinner from his sins, to restore the relationship that has been broken by sin with an unholy man to a holy God in the person of the Lord Jesus. That's the gospel. Repentance of sin, faith and trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus reaches out the hand of faith that was nailed on the cross. But you have to reach the hand back and take it. Take it by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so here's the crippled man. He could have said, you know, what? You man, who do you think you are? But he's not arguing. When he hears the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, not Peter the fisherman or John the fisherman, but when he hears about the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ and about the mighty wonders that had happened in his name, he gladly reaches out the hand of faith and takes the hand of Peter. Oh, friends, that's the gospel tonight. The beggars of sinners, the cripples of life, reaching out the hand, stretching out the hand of faith to take the hand of God in Christ Jesus. There was the lameness, there was the look, and there was the lift. And immediately, here's the power of God dispensed. Immediately instantaneously supernaturally super abundantly the power of almighty god flowed into that lifeless man's legs flowed into his ankle bones and the word of god says he received strength in other words supernatural power the power of the holy ghost the power of God, the same power that raised the Lord Jesus from the grave, raised this crippled man to his feet. This is the gospel we proclaim tonight. This is the power of God unto salvation to the crippled and dead in souls that Jesus is alive and he lives in the power of an endless life and the hands that reach out to him in faith and take him in his word shall be raised into resurrection life. What a gospel. What a message. And immediately his feet and ankle bones receive strength. I can, just, I can just imagine the scene. There's thousands going in to worship the God who had already rent the temple in two and said, no, that's not the way into my presence. Jesus is the way. And they're looking 
and they're gathered round. What phenomenon is going on in Israel in these days? What is happening in the city of Jerusalem? All these people speaking in unknown languages and languages that we never heard. What is going on? And all of a sudden, here's the first miracle. A crippled man raised to his feet. I, I, can, I can sort of vividly see this. He's lifted him up. Peter and John are standing with him. His legs, his ankle bones have received strength. This, there's more than one miracle here. He's never walked before. My little granddaughter had to learn to walk. And he's standing for the first time on holy ground. Oh, this is a precious spot. This is the place he's met the risen Christ. I dare say he had no shoes on his feet. He's met the living person Christ. He's received the strength from God. And then the next miracle takes place. He's not even falling down. But he starts to walk. I can walk. You just hear him to the crowd. Look, I'm walking. And I'm sure he was weeping with joy. And then he's leaping. Oh, hallelujah. He's leaping with the joy of the Lord. What he's done for this, this crippled man. What did he do? He met his need. Is not the gospel we proclaim? He met his need. Oh, friends, the Lord Jesus can meet your need tonight. I can't promise you that he lifts you out of a wheelchair, but he'll meet your need for sin. He'll meet the need. So there was this wonderful leap, this glorious look. On this mighty lift, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. And look at the release of God's power into the life. There's a picture of spiritual vigor. When the Lord saves you, he'll pour spiritual power into your soul for spiritual life. The release of God's power. We don't keep salvation. We are kept by the power of God. He keeps us. We can't keep it. He keeps us. If we'll follow him, he's faithful. And he looks after his children. Oh, the release of power. So there was the lameness. And I'll finish. And there was the look. He gazed into his face lately. And then there was the leap and the lift. What a picture tonight of what the Lord Jesus can do. This is only the start. And as a result of what happened at this particular event, there's 3,000 people get saved. If we could have read on in the passage. And Peter says to them, verse 12, Peter answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this, or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? And he goes on to preach the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he tells them to repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And as a result, in Acts 4 and 4, look at this. 
Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. Boys, when the Lord works, <laughs> he works. The first miracle, 5,000 souls added to the church. From three o'clock in the afternoon to six o'clock, this whole event took place. Three hours of bliss. Oh, I would long to be in the middle of the revival. It must have been like 30 minutes. Can you imagine the stories that were told about this mighty miracle, the beginning of miracles? And these people seen it. You can't deny it. They couldn't deny it. And when they came before the Sanhedrin and the Jewish council, they said, a mighty miracle has been done and no man can deny it, yet these men are ignorant and unlearned. In other words, they don't have any education. You don't need education. <laughs> you just need Christ. Education can be a hindrance. These men didn't have education. They didn't have money. But they did have power. The power of God. Friends, the time's gone. I want you to be encouraged tonight. Keep on praying. Keep on looking. And keep on living for the Lord Jesus. On one day, as we sang in our opening hymn, we'll be lifted too. These old corruptible bodies that'll be going into the grave, they'll be lifted out. Because there'll be a shout and there'll be a look and there'll be a lift and there'll be a supper. The Lamb's Supper will be there. Hallelujah. We'll be there. Amen. May the Lord bless his word tonight to all our hearts.